for that. So I'd like to welcome everybody this evening, all our Westmoreland members, all our visitors, and the, the students at Sedba School who are, are joining us this evening. Uh, it's the, the geology students there. So uh, thank you for, for, for coming along. Uh, tonight, we've got a very topical talk. It's the first of our winter lecture series. And uh, we have uh, Alison Monaghan from BGS, who is uh, a principal geologist based in Edinburgh. And she leads the science delivery of the Geoenergy Observatory in Glasgow, which is this underground laboratory focusing on shallow mine water uh, to extract geothermal and heat storage. Uh, very topical given the gas issues people have been talking about here. Uh, Alison uh, is uh, an expert in carboniferous geology and on geoenergy, both in Scotland and offshore in the UK. Her lecture tonight is uh, about the project up in Glasgow, this UK geoenergy observatory, uh, where they've got these 12 boreholes and yeah, it's a, uh, I'll hand it to, to uh, Alison to, to, to give a talk. Uh, and one last request, if people could mute and close their video, because uh, it helps the uh, bandwidth apparently on Zoom. So with that, if I could hand over to you, Alison, and welcome you to uh, our Westmoreland lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you tonight about the work that we've been doing in Glasgow. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you can uh, see my slides. OK, so hopefully that you can see my slides now. So um, as Richard said, um, I'm going to talk about um, drilling into mines, old coal mines, uh, for use of heat. And this is a project called the UK Geoenergy Observatories uh, based in Glasgow. There we go. So the talk today, first of all, I'm just going to step back a bit and talk about why we've got this subsur subsurface observatory or subsurface laboratory. Then I'll talk a little bit about what it is. I'll talk a little bit about the geology and the geology that we found drilling into the mines. And then I'll talk a little bit about the data that we're collecting more widely around the observatory for environmental monitoring. And also, so we know um, about how much heat we may or may not get out of mine water systems. And then just at the end, I'll just have a little bit of a forward look about what we hope will happen in the future. OK, so starting off looking a bit about why do we need um, a subsurface laboratory for mine water heat? So on this next slide that I've got here, um, we can see on the right hand side a number of different reports that have come out in the last year or so that are all about reducing carbon emissions, about um, this term net zero, so net zero carbon emissions. And a major part of that in the UK is around decarbonising our heating systems. The UK has made great progress in decarbonising electricity, but heat is a more difficult policy challenge and it's a difficult, more difficult technical challenge. And one of the things about decarbonising heat is that there actually are a lot of technologies that are already out there that we could use, but it just hasn't happened for various reasons. So one of the um, reports on this slide is the UK government energy white paper, which came out in December 2020. And some of the things in that report about heating buildings are installing 60, 600,000 heat pumps a year by 2028. So that's both air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. So that's different ways of heating buildings. And there's other technologies in there, biomethane, clean hydrogen, very much the use of district heating networks. So that's supplying heat in a different way to people. And there is an example in there of using heat from mine water energy at Seam in County Durham. So the government's 
um, across the UK and the, the, the UK government and the devolved governments are all looking at ways where our energy systems can be changed um, to take us away from using fossil fuels. And as geologists, therefore, our, our jobs and our roles are slightly changed. And, and really the stuff I'm going to talk to you today um, exactly mirrors that in my career, the kind of jobs I've done looking at oil and gas, and now I'm looking at, at clean heat, decarbonized heat from the subsurface. So going on a little bit more, I'm just going to explain a little bit about geothermal energy. So this image here is a cross section down, down through the earth and with a sort of scale bar here of about 500 meters. So geothermal energy is essentially heat from the earth, but roughly speaking, there are two kind of components to that. As we go deeper and deeper into the earth, the geothermal gradient increases, and that's um, heat from, from the center of the earth, which um, increases as we go down the way. But there's also in the shallow subsurface, so um, above 500 meters, um, solar energy heats up the ground and it heats up water, which then moves through the subsurface. And so there's a component of solar energy that heats up groundwater um, beneath our feet. And that's sometimes called geothermal and it's sometimes called ground source energy. And a lot of the heat that I'm talking about today is actually relatively shallow. It's maybe 100 meters below the ground and it's probably dominated by that kind of ground source energy, but there'll also be a component from heat deep within the earth. And there are lots of different types of geothermal energy that um, we could use in, in the UK. So there are two images on this slide. Um, I'll just explain and go through those. So this image on the left-hand side, the scale is from the ground surface down to about six kilometers. And if you drill really deep boreholes in parts of the UK, you can get temperatures that are high. So in this case, there's an example of 130 degrees. And then you can use the heat energy and the water, we use the water, the fluids that you uh, can then extract the heat from, but you can also extract power or electricity when you have high temperatures like that. The image on the right hand side is, is much shallower depth. So this is from about zero to about 800 meters down. And then obviously the temperatures are a lot lower, but those temperatures are still a lot higher than air and they're also a steady constant temperature. So um, there are different geothermal technologies that people use. Sometimes people use very shallow um, technologies in the top, top few hundred meters where temperatures maybe just get up to about 20 degrees C. And then sometimes they look deeper. And the thing I'm going to talk about mainly tonight is mine water geothermal, where we use the, um, the water that has flooded old abandoned mines and become warmed by the geothermal heat of the earth. And we use the heat within that water, we extract the heat um, as heat energy. And that has a really big potential across the UK. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is some research observatories that are helping us to understand how to extract that energy, how to best use it, how to make sure we do it sustainably and without many environmental impacts. And the UK actually at the moment, or the, the BGS, the Geological Survey, is involved in three geothermal observatories. One in Cardiff, looking at the very shallow sort of tens of metres underground. Um, one in Cheshire that's planned, looking at aquifer geothermal, which is a few hundred metres beneath the ground, and the observatory in Glasgow that I'll talk about, where we're going down to a few hundred metres beneath the ground, looking at mine water geothermal. So on this next slide, um, I've got a couple of pictures. So actually, I'm going to start just with this bottom picture, which is a picture of some houses and flats. And these are houses and flats in Glasgow that have been heated with mine water energy for, well, they were, it was active for about 20 years. It's actually not currently in operation. And it was a very small scheme. It heated about 16 homes, um, but it shows that mine water heat is, is quite possible and it, it is quite sustainable. Um, and the diagram on the left-hand side the map of the UK, I'll just explain what 
what the things are on it. So the, the blue hatched areas are all the areas of the UK that, are un, that have coal mines underneath them. Clearly, there are other areas of the UK that have, have other types of mines, but, but these are coal mines. And then the different coloured dots are places where people have either had geothermal mine water heat schemes, um, those are two schemes in Scotland that are no longer working, or in red, um, schemes that are actually active now, and in yellow, schemes that are being, uh, that are being developed at the moment. Um, there's one green spot, which is a um, scheme in development, but actually there's a lot more schemes like that. Um, I just haven't got them all on this diagram. And the Coal Authority, as kind of keeper of the UK's legacy coal mining um, system, is taking a, a very big role in developing these mine water schemes um, at different locations across the UK. So it's something that is happening um, in a number of different places. But these schemes are what we might call demonstrator or semi-commercial schemes. They're actually supplying heat into people's homes or businesses. Um, whereas what I'm talking about in Glasgow is an underground laboratory where we can do research and we can develop technologies. And in order to take forward geothermal across the UK, we kind of need both of these things. We need people to develop the, the economics and the, the sort of technical and commercial side. And we also need people to do underpinning research to reduce cost and risk um, and, and understand the wider environmental picture. So I've got a slide here just to explain a bit more about the practicalities of how you get heat from mine water. So I'll just try and explain. So at the bottom here on this slide is a picture of the underground. It's a cross section through a mined subsurface. So um, we've got a water table up here and we've got down here a number of abandoned mine workings. So you can see this kind of white areas and um, sort of black hatched areas. These are areas that are meant to signify where, where mine workings have taken place. And then after mining is finished, the pumps were switched off, the water level has risen, and this whole system is flooded and then becomes warmed um, by the geothermal heat. And so what we then do is we drill a borehole into these mine workings, through these mine workings, and we, through the borehole, we extract water, rather like you would with a water well, and we pump it out um, up to a, a heat centre, and that warm water goes through a heat pump, which is like the reverse of what you get in your fridge, and it can extract the heat from um, the water. So the water that goes in, from, that comes out of the ground, maybe is at 20 degrees C, you use your heat pump, and it comes out about 60 or 70 degrees. And the heat pump has a, something called a coefficient of performance of up to about four. That means you get four times more energy out than you put in. So then you've extracted your heat from your heat pump. And then normally you have a separate loop which supplies your heat to your homes or businesses. And then what you do is you put your water back into the mine system through another borehole. Um, which is a kind of relatively cool borehole, and you put the water back in a different place within the mine, and then it um, gradually works its way through the underground system and becomes warm again. And in that way, you have a sustainable system. There's also a possibility with these kind of systems to think about it the other way. Sometimes in the summer, you don't really need your heating, and you have an excess heat. So there might be factories or whatever at the surface that have excess heat. So something that people are looking into is actually storing excess heat underground in, in systems like this, in water and so on, in groundwater, that you can keep under the ground in the summer. And then when you need it in the winter, you can extract more heat and, and get your sort of balanced, sustainable system in that way. So that's another piece of kind of research that, that people are looking at using the underground for that purpose. On this next slide, I've got a picture of some coal measures rocks. So all, all the strata, the rock strata that we're talking about in the UK that contain coal generally occur in sequences of rocks that are 
very heterolithic. So they're sandstones, mudstones, siltstones, sometimes limestones and coal. So they're complicated rock sequences. The rocks behave in a complicated way. And what you can see on this image of a, this is an old open cast coal mine. You can see as we go along here, you can see also that there are faults disrupting this succession. And because coal sequences in the UK are carboniferous, they're quite often faulted as well. And so um, they're sometimes folded. The, the rock uh, structure is sometimes fairly complicated. So when you start thinking about um, extracting heat and flowing water through those, there's quite a lot of science um, that you have to understand uh, to do that um, safely and sustainably. And then if we think what miners have done, so the pictures at the bottom, there's a picture at the bottom which shows uh, what's called stoop and ream workings in Scotland or pillar and store workings in the north of England sometimes, where if you imagine these, these bits of coal that have been left were under the ground, it's just it's an open cast site, so all the rocks above have been mined off, but we can see these, these sort of stoop and ream or pillar and store workings which are pillars of coal that have been left, and then voids essentially underneath in the underground. And these are the voids that become filled with water um, once the mines are abandoned, which is like, that, that's the, the heat source for the geothermal energy, that water that carries the heat. Sometimes as well, we have um, long wall mining. So we've, uh, the miners took out um, great faces of coal and then the rock, collapse behind it and it forms uh, a very permeable, porous, collapsed rock mass, which again uh, has a lot of flow of water through it. So onto this kind of complicated sequences of coal measures rocks anyway, we're then mining through it, which, which makes it more complicated and makes fractures and all sorts in it. So there is a lot of um, science that we need to do, research we need to do to understand what happens when we then start pumping water in and through, through these mine working systems and how the heat gets transferred um, between the rock and the water. So I'm just gonna finalize um, talking the kind of theory be behind the observatory in Glasgow with this one slide, which sort of shows in the middle in this red box, what, what we've developed in Glasgow, which is a set of boreholes and monitoring and samples and infrastructure essentially. So some things in the ground, but what those things in the ground into the coal measures allow us to do is a load of science around things like how much heat is there? How does it get transferred? So that's like how much resource is there? And it enables us to do lots of monitoring around the environmental impacts of that. And it's also a place where people can come and test processes, test new technologies and so on. And what that means, hopefully, through time is that then um, the, the technology and the, the way of using the, the subsurface is, um, is translated into the right policies and uh, regulation it's acceptable to the public because people can see it can be done in a good way. Um, people are aware of it. And importantly for a lot of industry people, obviously it can be done economically, that it's something that's, that's worth doing. So that's part of the rationale for the observatory in Glasgow is to provide, provide that data and that evidence. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talking a little bit more detail about the observatory in Glasgow. So I'll just talk through the kind of different parts of the observatory. And um, so I'll start on the top left hand corner where I've said already we, we have to drill boreholes down into the ground. And um, so we've drilled 12 boreholes in Glasgow and we've got four fenced research compounds for people to come and use. But these kind of aren't ordinary boreholes. They are boreholes that have got a lot of sensors down the outside and I'll, I'll talk about those in a, in a little while. The boreholes that we've done a lot of sampling and monitoring of, um, and the boreholes that people can come and use as well. Um, another part of the work we've done in Glasgow is talking to local people and some educational engagement as well, because part of the 
the way we're going to change our energy systems is very much to get people on board with us to understand what their concerns are and to un help them to understand what we're trying to achieve and, and where the risks and impacts are and where they aren't. So part of, part of that is increasing our knowledge of what actually happens in the environment. And an important part of that is to monitor the environment before we start doing anything. So we know what's there already. So we've done a lot of work before we started on things like characterizing the chemistry of the surface water, the groundwater of the soil, um, and characterizing the gas environment as well, in case there was any movement of mine gases, for example. So I'll give some examples of those. And finally, on this slide, one of the really important things about the observatory is that the data that comes off the observatory is open access. So it's available for anybody to look at. Now, a lot of people might not might look at it and not understand it, but it is there so that if people want to see um, what the surface water data looks like, it's there. People can download it and they can see it and it's very open. Um, so that's both important for public approval and it's great for research because this body of knowledge builds up over many, many years. So I thought I'd just show you a couple of pictures about building the observatory. So back in uh, 2018 and 2019, we spent a long time standing in front of drilling rigs like this, drilling the 12 boreholes. Um, so these are fairly small, they're fairly standard uh, drilling rigs that you get onshore in the UK for geotechnical investigations. Um, we had one borehole that was cored. And this is an example of uh, a news article about the boring research that we were doing as we were drilling. Um, and here's a picture of us installing some of the casing into these boreholes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I'll probably skip that slide. And so I want to show you this photograph just to make you um, understand, I suppose, a bit better the kind of environment that the observatory is in. So this is an air photograph looking over where we've put the boreholes for the underground observatory. So the little dots are where we've drilled boreholes. So there's 11 of the boreholes are situated in this place called Cunningar Loop which is on a big meander of the River Clyde. So this is the River Clyde coming around here. And the city centre of Glasgow is over here. So we're in the east end of Glasgow. And this is an area of significant urban regeneration. It had a lot of heavy industry. And in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of regeneration. These houses here were built for the Commonwealth Games in 2014. Uh, which was part of a, a major regeneration effort. And the whole area um, in this Cunningar Loop and surrounding areas is underlain by a series of mine workings under the ground. And it's, so it's typical of many towns and cities across the UK where um, there's been a lot of industry and these are now areas of regeneration. Um, there are areas where people really would value um, heat for their homes, often their areas of deprivation and fuel poverty. So there's a real coincidence of where people need heat with where, where old mines may be able to provide heat. So just going back to our boreholes a little bit, um, you can see the boreholes are kind of arranged in a triangle and the green boreholes are boreholes that are what we call screened at the mine working. So they've gone down to a mine working and the borehole targets that mine working. And then the purple dots are environmental baseline boreholes. So they, they're shallower and they, they take a record of what's happening in the underground environment. And then we've got one borehole over here, uh, further, further west, and that borehole is the seismic monitoring borehole. So um, one of the things, one of the baselines that we monitor is the seismic, um, seismic monitoring network in the UK, which the geological survey runs, and that's to monitor for felt earthquakes. Um, and it really improves the resolution of the earthquakes that can be detected in the urban environment. Excuse me, Alison. Yeah. I, we, I don't think people can see your pointer 
when you're pointing to things okay. on the slide. Okay. All right. I will take that into account. So I will describe where I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, thank Richard. You. Okay. Um, okay. So hopefully that, that gives an overview of where the observatory is. So just to talk a little bit about the, the rocks and the mining in this area. So the mines that we're targeting in the observatory are um, from a colliery called the Farm Colliery. Uh, and on the left hand side of the slide, you can see a picture of the men who worked in the colliery. It, it was active from 1805 to 1932. So it's quite an old coal mine. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see um, the sequence of the coal measures that the colliery mined. So there are numerous coals, but they mined seven of the coals in this area. So there's a stack of seven mine workings and the coals range from about, um, about half a meter to about 1.2 to 1.5 meters thick that they, they mined. And the ones with the pink star are the ones that we drilled the boreholes into. The ones with the, the blue star down the side are ones that we, we haven't gone that deep. The boreholes haven't gone that deep. But it gives you an idea. It's a fairly typical sequence of coal measures um, strata from the UK. So it's, it's mudstone, sandstone, siltstone and coal with fossil bands. This is a, a cross section, a geological cross section through that system. And um, once we drilled the borehole, so you can see, see in the colored lines going down, those are the boreholes that we've drilled into the mine working system. And the different colors, well, the ones at the top are the quaternary superficial deposits, the, the glacial deposits, and they're really thick. They're about 30 meters thick in this location. And then we drilled down into mine workings. Um, so we've targeted the Glasgow Upper Coal, which is the top mine working, which is at about 50 meters down. And then we've targeted the Glasgow Main mine working, which is at about 85 to 90 meters down. And there's one mine working in between those two, the Glasgow L Coal. So this is a similar similar kind of cross-section view of those boreholes, but you can see a bit more in this diagram what the mine workings look like when we've drilled the boreholes or what, what we interpret they're like. So the top coal seam that we've encountered, the Glasgow upper seam, the, the picture is meant to represent that there's some coal pillars in place. That's the, the strong black, um, the strong black fill. And then in between those, there are some voids where the, the coal has been entirely worked out and some areas where there's coal mining waste has been um, left. And, and this all makes a difference for our heat resource and our flow of water is, is what the mines like when, when you get the borehole into it. And then the key thing with this, this particular diagram is just to highlight that the boreholes have cables down the outside that measure the temperature down the outside. So they have fiber optic cables that measures continuously the temperature down the outside of them. And they also have cables that are for something called electrical resistivity tomography. That means we can take a sort of picture between the boreholes of the electrical character of the underground. And if we do that through time, it helps us see potentially fluids moving through the subsurface. We've also got in the boreholes, we've got sensors that measure the temperature and the water level. So just moving on in this slide, I just thought I'd show you some pictures of one of the, the borehole that was cored. This is the, the deepest borehole, which was 200 meters deep. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, some of the typical rock types that you get within the coal measure succession. Um, there's a picture of some lovely plant fossils, for example, and mus mu uh, marine bands. There's a mussel band, which is called the canvas lung marble because it's um, just got so many um, shells forming um, a limestone within, within the coal measures. And we also 
found some good examples in the core of um, small scale faulting and mineralization. And these cores that were taken have been through um, a, a core scanner, which is at the Geological Survey Office in Nottingham, near Nottingham in Keyworth. And so this core scanner um, measures the chemical and physical properties of the core. And what you're seeing in the middle of this slide is also an X-ray image of the core. And this is important because it can help scientists to understand the rock properties and how that might respond to um, mine water and different chemistries of water, for example. So this was our reference section, this core, and it, it was good because it, it shows really that we've got fairly typical coal measures in the area, which is good because it means that the results from here can be applied in other places. OK, so I've just got a few slides now about drilling into the mines. And I have to say, in my career, this is probably the most nerve wracking thing that I've ever done. It's it's a kind of very real thing that you're, you're drilling into the mines and you don't know what's going to get. Those of you that have maybe worked within this kind of industry in the either the water industry or the energy industry will know that drilling boreholes is is there is risk in doing it. You don't quite know what you're going to get. So the picture on the left hand side, the bottom left hand side of this slide is somebody standing in an open cast coal mine site. And what I want to illustrate with this slide is that you can see there's kind of two tunnels, which are the old mine workings and where, where the person's standing, there's also a thick coal that hasn't been worked. And so if we, if we drilled two boreholes, so the green lines that I've just put on, imagine those are boreholes that we're drilling into the underground. They're only, what, five or, or so metres apart, but one of them would hit a tunnel that was full of water, and one of them would go through a coal that, that would, we could probably get some water out of it, but it would be a very different, what we'd call reservoir or aquifer for geothermal heat. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty and risk in, in drilling boreholes. So it was quite nerve wracking, but we got some really good results from drilling into the mines. On the right hand side of this slide is what one of the boreholes looks like close up. So you can see in this borehole, it's actually got a number of steel casings and then the blue is a plastic casing that lines the borehole. And then the red um, thing is the electrical resistivity tomography sensor. And next to that is a, the fiber optic cable that measures the temperature going down the borehole. And the kind of gray um, gravelly looking thing is the screen section. So that's where the water flows into the borehole. Um, from the mines, obviously, once it's been put, put into the borehole. So how do we know what we think we're going to get underground? Well, before we started drilling the boreholes, we had different sources of information. People have drilled a lot of boreholes in Glasgow over the years, and at the Geological Survey, we have a lot of those records, so we use those. We also use mine plans, so the Coal Authority holds the UK catalogue of mine plans, and you can look at how the, the miners recorded where they'd mined out and they recorded the type of mine working. So we looked at those and, and the image on the left is, is a kind of map of the different types of mine working. And we can create those into 3D geological models to help us uh, decide where to drill the boreholes and what we think we're going to get when we drill them. For those of you that are particularly interested in borehole design, I've just put this slide in and I'll just mention it very quickly, but um, they were quite complicated boreholes because of the sensors and because um, we needed to isolate a thick artificial ground from the rest of the borehole. So they had three casing strings on them. This slide just gives you an idea of what it looks like down the borehole. And I'm actually gonna show you a video um, in a couple of slides time going down the borehole. But the slide just shows you what some of the coal looks like um, and the mine workings look like down the borehole. So on the, the image on the left-hand side 
This is actually the Glasgow upper coal and it's intact. So that's the actual coal, the kind of black in the middle. And it's, it's a, over a metre thick in this borehole. In the middle image, um, this is where we went through the Glasgow L mine working. And, and the mine working here has been filled with mine waste and then is slightly collapsed. And so there's a kind of grey bit towards the bottom of that image, which is the, the waste that the miners put back into the, the working. And it's formed like a breccia now. It's, it's like a breccia with a mudstone matrix. And then finally, on the right hand side, this is our target mine working. And essentially, the mine working is the black in the middle of this image, because this was a void beneath a sandstone roof. Um, a water filled void, which is what we were looking for. And at the bottom, you can see this is the, called the floor of the mine working and the, the floor's kind of uneven, it's lifted a bit. Um, but that was our target for, for this borehole. And that was a really good outcome because it was a water filled void that we could take the water out of to take the heat out of it. So this, this image here is just to really summarize what I've just described in those last few slides. Essentially, we, we drilled into the mines and we're looking for, um, say, nice open voids within the mine working to take out the water. But sometimes we get different types of fill within the mine. Sometimes it's collapsed bits of rock that are highly porous. Sometimes it's, it's packed waste that the miners have put in there. And all these things will influence how much water and heat we get out. So now I'm going to attempt to show you a video. So hopefully this will work. So hopefully you can, you can see this video and it's not too jerky, but this is a video taken down, going down one of the boreholes before the plastic blue casing went in. So it's filled with water and you can see the little, uh, sort of little light bits are just bits of um, rock chips from the drilling process, but we're going down now, we're going down through areas where the rock wall is, is a bit uneven. And some of these are, um, one of them I think just coming up, this is the Glasgow L working that's packed with, with waste. And I think in this bit, we just hit this bit of sandstone and then the camera bumps off it in a minute. And we'll get over that bit, but we're going down towards the mine working at the bottom of this borehole. And that's how, this is how we access the water. Um, and it's really, it's just a black void when we get there, the mine working. As we get close to it, we're getting close. Now we start to see fractures. So at the bottom of the screen, we start to see fractures in the borehole wall. And we're coming, we're coming to the mine working now, which is the black water filled void that is our target. Um, so we're just about to go into it now. And there we are. So that's kind of going, going down a borehole for, for mine water heat and what it's like drilling into a mine working. Oops, I'm just gonna try and move the slides on. So just to summarize really this, this bit of the talk, this is um, a kind of 3D image of the boreholes that we've drilled into the underground. So these are the boreholes going into the mine workings arranged in this triangle. And they're arranged in the triangle to enable us to do, um, do research at different scales. So both across different depths, across different mine workings and, and across different um, length scales, across different times. Um, they're about 100 meters to 120 meters apart. And what we're going to do in a month or so is join up these, um, these boreholes at the surface using a pipe, a mine water pipe, and we're going to put um, geothermal infrastructure on the boreholes so that we can abstract and uh, re-inject the water in a closed system into the boreholes. And that means people can do research about what actually happens in the underground when we're changing the water flow and the heat flow in this system. So I thought I'd um, go now and just describe some of the types of data that we're collecting. So 
as a, I started off my career as a field geologist and clearly we went outside and we, we collected traditional data in notebooks um, about the rocks that we mapped. Um, we, we created geological models, but now what we're doing is collecting different sorts of data to help us with this new kind of energy challenge. And it's data through time as well, um, which is different than, than maybe what we did in previous times. So one of the key pieces of data we need to know about for mine water heat or, or geothermal generally in the shallow subsurface is um, about the hydrogeology. It's about how much water can you get out? Um, what rate can you take it out? Is it sustainable to take that water out? What temperature is it? And so on. And also what's the chemistry of the water? Um, is that gonna cause problems for your pipes and your pumps and so on? So here's two pictures of my colleagues when we were what we call test pumping the boreholes. So seeing how much water would come out. And this again was quite nerve wracking because again, this is a really key thing for your resource. If you imagine if this had been an oil and gas well, it would have been how much oil and gas was there and how much would have come out. But in this case, it's how much water can you get out and how do the boreholes respond? So I'm going to show now two graphs of the kind of results you get when you pump your boreholes. So on the left hand side is something called a step test um, and the borehole that's being pumped in this case is the the blue line at, towards the bottom of the graph and it's called a step test. You can see the steps. So what happens is they they pump the borehole at increasing rates. So in this case, they started off pumping it at five liters a second and then they increased it in five liter steps till they got to pumping it at 25 litres a second. And those are the water levels in the borehole as the pumping increases. And then the other lines on the graph are what happens in the other boreholes round about. So you're looking at your responses in your other boreholes to see how the system behaves. So that was one type of pumping test that was done. And on the right hand side is a slightly simpler type of test in that it's just a, called a constant rate test. You just pump at a constant rate. So this was a five hour test. And again, you're looking at if how much water you get out and what happens to the water level. And in this case, you can see that they were pumping at 20 litres a second. And after an initial phase when the water level dropped in the borehole, it was fairly steady. And so really this, this was a, a good borehole for this rate of pumping. So those were really positive because that's, that's what you need for mine water heat. You need to get a good amount of water out without the level of the water being uh, significantly lowered. So the other thing we've been doing, as I mentioned before, is doing a comprehensive set of surveys on what the environment, the, the geological environment and the, the surface environment were like before we did anything at the observatory. And this means we can look at ongoing environmental change. So the pictures are some of my colleagues doing soil chemistry sampling and also doing surface water sampling. And we've also done gas surveys and looked at the groundwater as well. So just got a few pictures of the, some of these results. Um, just to give a flavour of the type of data, and all this data is available. Um, so, for example, the soil chemistry data, um, the graph on the right hand side is a graph of premium six, which is a particularly nasty um, species of chromium that is a problem in the east of Glasgow because there was a very large chromium ore processing factory to the, to the west of this site. And these are the kind of challenges that you have in an urban area. And in fact, this graph shows that in this area, the, the results are well below the, the red lines, which are the kind of guideline amounts that you'd be worried if, if you were over. Um, so thankfully we, we didn't have, um, too much of a problem with, with chromium-6. But some of the other elements that were analysed, like on the left-hand side is, is a plot of lead content in the soil, um, was really variable. And that's not surprising because 
the shallow subsurface in this area is, is essentially an old tip. Um, so it had building rubble and other things put on it. So it's not surprising that it's quite variable, the, the shallow subsurface. But this is why we do do this beforehand. So we know that it's like that before we've started doing any geothermal activities. We also did gas surveys. So we wanted to know, was there any, any evidence of mine gas? Um, because that could be a problem or a risk for... Um, for mine water geothermal, but we, we haven't, essentially we haven't found any evidence of mine gas. All the gases that were found were due to photosynthetic effects in the, in the soil or microbial effects in the soil. So just to finish off this talk, I just want to kind of look forward a bit because we're at the point now where we've, we've kind of finished building the observatory or we will we'll do fairly shortly. And we very much would like scientists, both from universities or from industry um, or for, from other sectors to come and use the observatory to get the research done. So one of the things I've already mentioned is that there's a lot of data on the website, um, which, is, which is on this slide. So we, we made a lot of data openly available um, and Hopefully that that will be a good starting point for lots of people to use the observatory. And the next slide is just a, an example of how people might use it. So um, we've seen the diagram before. This is a kind of cross section of the underground with the boreholes. But just to give you an idea of what we might expect people to do, we might expect them to come and say, do some pumping of the mine workings and then use all the sensor cables to look at how the temperature changes in the underground or the um, use the monitoring to look at the flow in the underground and that will mean in the boreholes that are nearby how long does it take for them to feel the effect of that pumping what impact does it have on th their temperature and that will tell us how much heat we can take out of the system in a sustainable way. It'll tell us how connected the mine workings are and the kind of factors that people will need to think about when they come to put in these schemes for the long term. So just to finish off, um, hopefully I've given you a bit of a flavor of how the flooded coal mines that are under many of our towns and cities could be used for sustainable heating and possibly also for thermal storage. I've summarised that there are already some schemes happening, uh, particularly in the northeast of England, and the, the Coal Authority is doing a lot of work on that. Um, so it's something that, that is starting to happen. But the observatory that I've talked about in Glasgow is fairly unique because it's a, it's a publicly funded infrastructure where researchers and people who've developed technologies can come and, and use it like you would a laboratory, but it's much more complicated than a, than a laboratory situation. It's a real world situation at scale. And it should help people to understand how much heat resource is there, what impacts there are, and it's a place where people can develop new things. And hopefully on a more kind of um, general note, I hope I've given you a bit of an insight into what it's like drilling into mines. Um, and what an underground observatory actually looks like. It, it doesn't look much on the surface, but hopefully some of the, the down, downhole things have, have helped you understand. And hopefully I've tried to explain a bit why as geoscientists we're really changing some of the things that we do. Um, we're looking much more about monitoring the earth in space and time and these new ways of getting energy from the earth. So I shall leave it there. I'll just finish with my kind of thank you slide because there was an awful lot of people involved in what I've talked about today. There was an awful lot of people at BGS. And if, if people are interested, I'd be very happy to answer questions now or later and to speak to people about um, what, what we might do at the observatory in the future. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Alison, for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, given us a real insight into potentially a, a 
an exciting way of heating buildings, which after all, I think takes up a huge percentage of our energy consumption uh, in the UK. So if anybody would like to ask Alison any questions, I open it to the first one. So. Silence. Okay, I've got a question. Go ahead, Audrey. You talked about uh, some schemes that had been started and were no longer working. What's happened to those schemes uh, to cause them to stop working? You know, has something gone wrong with them that you need to think about in terms of uh, giving advice for future schemes? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. So one of the schemes in Scotland, it stopped working essentially because some air got into the system. And so it was essentially, it's a maintenance issue. Um, and when air gets into the mine water system, because of the chemistry of the mine water, when it becomes exposed to the air, it the iron within it precipitates, as, as you may have seen, if you've seen streams um, that have come off mine workings, they're often really, um, really red. So I think in that instance, um, the, the, the sealed loop system had been damaged and air had got into it. And I think what, what's really interesting, and I think this is possibly at the root of the second scheme that isn't working, but I don't actually fully know, um, is that maintenance is needed on these systems, but there aren't the people that really know that much about it. It's a very small number of people. And so one of the challenges about um, these technologies going forward is, is really the, there's a whole new set of skills that uh, people have got to learn about how to maintain these systems. Um, so I think, yeah, as we go forward, there's definitely a lot to learn from what's gone wrong. Um, and, but they did, they did operate for 20 years or so. So that, that's a real positive. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. I have a question from Chris Jackson. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, Alison. Thank you for the talk. It was really, really awesome. I know nothing about this subject at all. And um, what would you say is the most poorly characterized part of the projects in terms of the, the stratigraphy? So the, the, the units that are being drilled into, is it the primary stratigraphy of the, of the depositional system? Or is it the later structural overprint due to the kind of workings collapse or, or unknown faults and folds and so forth? Yeah, I think, um, I think across the UK, people, people have a good handle on coal measure stratigraphy. There's maybe not so much been done in, in recent years, but there was a lot done maybe 10, 15 years ago, certainly on the Nemurian parts of the sequence um, in England. So, so there's a good understanding of that. I would say is certainly the, the structural aspects of a fairly complicated structural regime anyway, a faults and folds, but then overprinted by mining, so collapsed due to mining in a complex sequence. And then the thing that we, we really don't know about is what's happened since the mines have closed. So clearly in the UK when people were mining, were mining coal, there was mining engineers understood a lot about how coal mines behaved at that time, how they collapsed. But what, what we don't know is if you then leave it for 100 years and it's flooded, what's happened in that 100 years and how, how is the subsurface now going to respond? So I think that, that anthropogenic fracturing and, and the evolution since then is something that we, we don't know so much about. Mm. Super, thank you. Do we have anyone else who'd like to ask Alison a question? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sylvia. Um, it's all very, it's all really interesting, is this, Alison? And it just, uh, um, it's very interesting to us in Cumbria 
when we have got a proposed coal mine which is actually proposing to take coal out and it strikes me that to take hot water out of mm -hmm. the old coal mines might be a much better option. However, my question really is, you're doing some very detailed research. Um, can you give me any sort of time scales as to when you might say um, we can try and put this mine water into heating real houses? Yeah, so I mean, hopefully the, the projects that are happening in Northeast England at the moment um, will be on stream in, in a time scale of years. And that there are, there's a couple of schemes in Northeast England where they're heating warehouses already using this technology. So I think that there's kind of like um, some, I guess, real sort of examples, exemplars where people are doing it and they've had, they have had some government support and they've got local authority support and so on. The, the challenge is, is to make that widely applicable in lots of different places. And I guess there's a, there's a whole raft of things that need to be in place for that to happen um, from kind of government and policy and incentives to make, make it more economic compared to gas, for example. Um, policy and licensing to make it attractive for people so they know that the resource isn't going to run out, as well as all the technical things I'm talking about. However, I would say, I mean, in my career, which is sort of 20 odd years, I've never seen things move so fast. I think things that are really moving fast at the moment with, with government trying to reach net zero targets. Yeah. Um, I think the COP26 summit that's happening in Glasgow in, in a month or so, yeah. again, is, is really galvanizing action. It'd be interesting to see if that carries on after, after COP26. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the will is there and, and things are happening. So hopefully, with, with clever people coming in from academia and from industry as well, from industry developing things, then we might, we might be able to move quite quickly, but yeah, but let, let's hope. <laughs> Do you think that your experiments will involve putting water back into the mines? Have you, have you got that plan to have boreholes which reinsert the water? Yes, very much so. So that's part of the kind of sustainability of the system is that you do it in what's called a sealed open loop. So you're both taking out and putting the same water back in to be reheated. And that it, well, it just saves a lot of a problem in terms of what you're going to do with the water. However, saying that, the coal authority actually, one of the, the kind of easier things to do, they've got a lot of pumping stations across the UK anyway which are, the, the water is then treated, that water, because they're, they're having to pump the mine for various reasons. So they're actually, one of the schemes they're developing is using one of those types where they're having to pump the water anyway, and they're taking the heat out of that water they're having to pump anyway. Yeah. Well, very interesting, thank you. No problem. Um. Can I ask a question, Richard, please? Yes, do, please. Um, that was very interesting, Alison. Um, Thank you. Very exciting new technologies. But rather following on from the last question, have you any idea or can you give us any idea of costs? Because drilling is a horrendously expensive um, undertaking, I understand. But how does it compare with other uh, green energy res resources? Yeah, so, so cost is, is one of the challenges. Um, it, it is expensive drilling um, and it, it is a bit risky, which is some of the, the things we're, we're trying to address. Um, it, it is something though that once you've got that infrastructure there, it does last for an awfully long time if you've, if you've got the right resource. But I think there is a lot of work to be done still looking at the economics compare, of comparing these different technologies. Um, and one of the things that um, a scheme over in, in the Netherlands has done is it, they've got these district heating schemes, so um, sort of shallow pipe work that joins everything up, and they've got factories and businesses, and some of them um, produce heat, they, they've got too much heat, and some of them 
need heat they want to, to heat homes and so they they kind of balance the system and they use the mines as like a, a, a battery or a reservoir right. and and also for the heat and so it, it's it's a very sort of clever system and if you if you do things in that way then that can really change the economics I think because it, it it's much more efficient and effective rather than just doing one thing which is taking the heat out so I think th there's a lot of different potential but yeah there's there's no getting away from the fact that that economics and the drilling costs is is a major challenge at the moment I guess too and maintenance from what you were saying that's ongoing and presumably quite specialized and, and expensive too yeah I think um it compared to some things like a, a nuclear power station or, or something like that, clearly the, the maintenance is, is relatively easy. And I think people probably do have the technologies to do it, but it, like any system, yeah, it, it does need, need some maintenance. Mm. Thank you, thank you. The uh, Netherlands example sounds very interesting. <laughs> Alison, could I ask you a, a question? Uh, yep. Have you had any uh, interaction with some of the larger energy companies who may or may not be interested in participating? I'm thinking maybe some of the oil and gas companies with their drilling technology. Yeah, so we've, we've had some initial conversations and that's very much an area where, where we'd like to talk to people more and see if um, if they'd like to use the observatory and, and there's a big push obviously to transfer skills where there's a huge amount of knowledge and skills in North Sea oil and gas, for example, that is applicable to geothermal energy. Um, and certainly talking to some of the big companies would be really, really good. And we have started those conversations, but because we're just getting to the point of it kind of being ready for people to use, we're just we're just at the start of that process. Um, so hopefully a lot more conversations to come and, and interest in, in this and, and potentially the other types of geothermal across the UK. Um, obviously some of the deeper geothermal boreholes are probably more similar to some of the oil and gas techniques and technology. And I have a technical question as well. I was interested yeah. in the slide that you had that showed the voids and the pillars and where the different boreholes had, had uh, encountered the, the coal seams. Yeah. Are you able to predict voids versus pillars or is it at the moment still rather random and fingers crossed as to what you will encounter? Uh, yeah, I think um, that would be that's a piece of work we need to try and bring together all the, the schemes that have been drilled and things but the mine plans it really depends on the mine plan you've got so some of the mine plans are really excellent they're very well geographically located even though they're they're quite old you can mm -hmm. you can put them in the right place very easily and then you can see where they've got the pillar and stall workings. And if you can locate all that very accurately and you've got a good driller that can drill very accurately, then you've got a much higher success rate. But I think we found that even we had good mine plans, but the error in where you put them was still too big, really. It was still a bit of luck and a combination of luck and judgment, I think. Um, and that is something, again, that, that we need to think about going forward. I mean, people have, you can drill some very narrow, cheap boreholes to start with to find out, um, for example. The other thing is people maybe can look at new geophysical techniques so that you can mm. maybe think, is there a way that you can work out where um, what the condition of the mine working is? People have come up with all sorts of ideas. Like if you've got an existing shaft nearby, could you put a little robot um, with a camera on it into the old mine? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, people are very inventive and I'm sure we will we'll tackle those kind of things. But yeah, ultimately there is some, some difficulty, difficulty knowing 
exactly what you're going to hit because it's a very a system that varies on a meter scale so it is quite tricky so when when you're drilling your boreholes if you say you encounter a void with your first borehole you'd be yeah. very pleased because obviously the water's going to flow yeah uh, how much of a setback is it if you then drill through the center of a pillar well that's it's really interesting i think it, it just depends because actually if the pillar if the whole system is very fractured then actually you could still get quite good results from, from that. Or the other thing that you might do, and, and we did in one occasion, is that you actually, if you drill through a coal that's a pillar, but you know you've got a deep, some of the boreholes have got deeper targets, and you carry on drilling because you, you don't want to stop there. But if you'd got a void, we would have stopped there. So there's a bit of responsive, um, when, when you're drilling a number of boreholes, you can be a bit responsive depending on what, what you find. Um, yeah. Oh. Well, does any, anybody else have, have any questions for, for Alison? No, doesn't, doesn't seem Somebody. like anyone else. One, one question, if I may, please, Richard. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just, just, just to ask, if, is, is there any read across from the research that's being done here looking at using old mine workings into the sort of wider um, work that's being done on um, ground source heat pumps in in differing types of strata I mean is, is this is this is the work work that's resulting from this um, this this um, underground laboratory in Glasgow is that going to have any benefit for for um, for for, um, uh, for for similar sorts of similar sorts of work that different strata elsewhere in the country? Um, <coughs> <laughs> difficult to answer. I mean, hopefully, um, because there are some generic things about maybe the transfer of heat from water to rock, um, about when we've got our heat center on top potentially we're going to have it so it's quite flexible so like people could come and plug in their new heat pump if mm -hmm. you've got a new design or something you could come and plug in your heat pump and see if that works better and it's just somewhere where you've got the facility to do that um so hopefully it might be relevant i would say that the the other observatories cover ground source heat and ground source heat pumps as well. So there's also scope there when, when those get going, or the potential one gets going to, to do a lot of work in that area. Okay, right, thank you. Been very, very useful, very interesting. Really. Okay. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, then I would like to say thank you, Alison, on behalf of the Westmoreland Geological Society for for giving us a, a very exciting, interesting lecture. And there's a couple of things I take away from it in addition to the discussions we've already had. And one is it opens a window onto career opportunities for, for young geologists who may be considering uh, a career uh, using their geological skills uh, as, the, as the oil and gas world seems to be sh ever shrinking it's great to see these, these new opportunities for, 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 for geologists. And also to have that huge open access database for researchers, students, because there are now a number of new MSCs uh, available on energy studies. So I think for some of these uh, MSC uh, individual projects, your, your database would be a a fabulous place to, to do your project. So I think it's, it's really exciting. So again, thank you very much. It's been a really, really interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you for having me.